By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday and this is a special day because we're going to look at the Wizards Cup again. But this is not just a match, this is the finals of the tournament. So 37 players started this journey of the Dark, Fallen Empires and Homelands because those are the three sets that you can use to brew with. And only two players remain. Rob from the Netherlands who's playing Dwarven Tribal and he's going to play against Canadian player Alex who's playing a red-white soldier burn deck so this is going to be very very interesting the winner is the winner of the wizards cup the first ever wizards cup now if you would like to know more about this tournament or if you would like to see all the other matches if you've missed any check out the description below there you will find a link to the playlist but also a link to the tournament website where you can find all the information about you know the decks the rules there's also a restricted list so you can check all of that out on the tournament website. As for now, we are going to continue with the deck tech. So I'm first going to discuss the deck of Rob and Alexander, and then we go right to the action. Now, if you want to skip this, I know some of you do. Again, check the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. Click on there, and that will take you straight to the action. And here I'm going to start with the deck tech, starting with the deck of Rob. Let's take a look. Before we jump into the deck deck, I just want to take a moment to look at this beautiful map with you. This is handmade by one of the contenders of the Wizards Cup. Uh, his name is Frank and he made this beautiful map inspired by the lore of the Dark Fallen Empires and Homelands. So if you look closely at this map, uh, you can see the different areas of Dominaria where these sets, where the stories of these sets take place. And then when you kind of zoom in, you can read uh, specific uh, specific places you can look at specific forests so i see anhava i see asen i see castle sengir on this map uh, i see marion at the left top corner of this map i see the dwarven hold the dwarven ruins um you know so everything on this map is inspired by the lore of these three sets and inspired by this tournament and it's just amazing that somebody took the time to make this i think this is really this is kind of the love level for the game that you want to have you know it's 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 the game is yes it's a game that you want to win but for a much bigger part it's a game of flavor of fantasy of lore of you want to really you know dive into something um in dutch you say onderdompelen you really want to get into the mood into the the atmosphere into the world that is Magic the Gathering, you know, and, and, and that is such a big part of enjoying the game. And I think this map is a great example of that. Uh, also lovely, by the way, I just want to point out the Sea Singer, because he told me that was really a challenging thing to draw. And he was a little bit nervous that by making such a big Sea Singer, if something went wrong with the drawing, that he would kind of mess up the whole card. So that was pretty nerve wracking, he told me. But I think the Sea Singer looks absolutely stunning, beautiful, and as and such a an important part uh, of this in this map on this map i should say so it's really nice and he did this in several steps so it's not like he started with markers he first did it uh, just with making little pencil drawings if you want to see more about uh, the process of making this particular map by the way you can also find that on the tournament website and the link is in the description below so uh, yeah, beautiful map. Thank you, Frank, for making this. It's just, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, and now let's go to the first deck deck. Let's take a look at the deck of Rob. And here we see the deck of Rob. So as you can see, it's mono red, it's dwarven tribal. And I'm just really happy to see decks like this getting far in a tournament and really having cards like, you know, Aaron the Relentless, Heart Wolf, Dwarven Soldier. Uh, there's just so many cards in this deck. You know, give those cards that are usually don't see any play, uh, their moment in the spotlight. And I think it's great, Rob, that you've reached the finals with this deck. Now, the first thing that I notice actually when I'm looking at this are cards that are missing. Because when I'm thinking Mono Red, I'm thinking Bull Lightning, I'm thinking Fisher, and you're not playing with both of those cards. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, that, that you don't have any removal or any ways to deal damage to your opponent. Because we do see, for example, two Eternal Flames. And Eternal Flame is a card from the dark, two red and two to cast for a sorcery, and Eternal Flame deals any amount of damage to your opponent equal to the number of mountains you control. 
and half of that damage it does back to you. So for example, if you have eight mountains, it deals eight damage to your opponent and four damage to you. Now this of course works great in a mono red deck. It means that especially when you're more on, when a game takes longer, so you're more in late game, um, you have an advantage because your Eternal Flame, if you draw it later in the game, it gets stronger and stronger. So I definitely think that Eternal Flame is going to play a big part, a big role in this matchup. And next to Eternal Flame, we see Inferno. So Inferno is another one of those famous burn spells from the dark. What I like about Inferno is that it's an instant two red and five to cast an Inferno does six damage to all players and all creatures. Now, Inferno is going to have, I think, a special... Uh, part in this final, a special place in the finals. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that the opponent of Rob today, Alex, is also playing with Inferno and he does that because he kind of has a strategy. He's got Abby Gargoyle and he's got um, the Knights of Thorn and those are two cards that have protection from red. In other words, if you play Inferno, they are not affected by the damage of Inferno. So they survive after an Inferno. So Inferno looks good in this deck, but it can actually backfire on Rob because he's playing against a lot of pro-red creatures. And in general, I think those pro-red creatures, they can make the difference in this finals. But we're going to we're gonna look at that deck of Alex later. Of course, right now we're zooming in to the deck of Rob and a few other cards that um, I'd like to mention here is Retribution. Retribution, a card from Homelands, uh, a sorcery, two red and two to cast. And what it does is um, your opponent has to choose two target creatures and one of those creatures gets a minus one, minus one counter, and the other one gets sacrificed. So in, in, in the most ideal situ scenario, this would be a nice two for one. And in a worse scenario, it would just be a one for one, and you would get that little minus one, minus one counter as a bonus. So I think this is a really strong card. And keep that minus one, minus one counter in mind, because Rob is also playing with two orcs. So of course, the orc you know, O-R-G-G, -G, two rat and three to cast for this monstrous creature, a six, six trampler. But the thing is the orc may not attack uh, if the opponent controls, or block actually, if the opponent controls an untapped creature with power um, three or greater, right? So the orc is kind of limited. But in this format, there are way more small creatures than big creatures. And think, for example, again, of the... Um, of the Abbey Gargoyle, you know, it's a 3-4. If you can get a minus one, minus one counter on there, all of a sudden it's a 2-3 flyer, and that means that Orc can just attack. Of course, then, in the case of Abbey Gargoyle, it still, it still has protection from red, so I guess that's not the best example. But the fact is that there are not that many um, high-powered creatures in, in this format. So Orc, actually, I think it's really, really... Uh, smart choice of Rob to put that in. And I, I believe I mentioned there are two, but there are actually three orcs in his deck. Um, and then we also, have, of course, have four AO piles. And talking about full play sets, he has also decided to play with a full play set of Dwarven Catapults. And I think they can be very, very strong. And I'm hoping to see Dwarven Catapult, Dwarven Hold, because I just think that's so flavorful. So Dwarven Hold is one of those um, storage lands in uh, in Fallen Empire. In case you're not familiar with these lands, they're quite special. They come into play tapped, and during your upkeep, uh, you put a storage counter on there. And for Dwarven Hold, it's one storage counter. You can take that off the Dwarven Hold again for one mountain. And the cool thing is, once you decide to untap Dwarven Hold, you can tap it, and if you want to, you can just take all your storage counters off. So maybe it's got four, maybe it's got five. You can all take them off, or just one. You know, it's, it's up to you, it's your choice. Um, and this works, of course, very, very good with the Dwarven Catapult. I mean, imagine having a Dwarven Hold, playing it turn one, and then in turn 10 or turn 11, you decide to untap it, and you've got all this mana, and you can play a huge Dwarven Catapult and basically wipe away all the creatures of your opponent. I mean, that is and very strong and very flavorful, and that's kind of what I like. I mean, a Dwarven Catapult being cast by a Dwarven Hold, how cool is that? Looking at this deck photo, by the way, it's done... Um, in a way that it looks like the creatures and the spells are kind of running out of the Dwarven Ruins and the Dwarven Hold and the mountain range that you kind of see at the top of the deck photo. So also the deck photo is uh, is pretty sweet. Then we see in the main deck, and I kind of want to point this out, an Apocalypse Chime. So Apocalypse Chime, I haven't seen it in action yet in this tournament, uh, at least not here uh, on Timmy Talks. It's two to cast and then two and tap and then sacrifice the Chime and then you destroy... Uh, all the cards or bury all the cards from the Homelands expansion. 
So this card can be very, very powerful, and it actually can kind of backfire on Rob as well, because he's playing with quite some Homeland cards. Then on the other hand, you know, he's the one controlling the chime, so he can decide when he wants to use it. Okay, so this is the deck of Rob. It's Mono Red, it's war Dwarven Tribal. It's, it's pretty strong, it made it all the way to the finals. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, the deck of Alex. And here we see the deck of the other finalist, Alex from Canada. And as you can see, he's playing white and red and also a bunch of artifacts there right in the middle. So there's a strong artifact presence here as well. And I think those artifacts are going to be important because we, when we looked at Rob's deck, we saw uh, those orcs, right? Three orcs, six, six trampler. Well, you really want to stop those orcs. You want to make sure that they cannot attack. And there are four creatures in his artifact uh, section that actually can do that for him. Clockwork Swarm and the three Clockwork Steeds. I mean, they are four, three creatures, right? So they're too big and they're going to stop the orcs. Other creatures that can do that for Alex here are the Abbey Gargoyles and also the Order of Lightbur if you pump it every time, right? It's got two, two power by itself, but for two white, you pump it and that means that then the opponent cannot attack with it anymore because uh, the Order of Lightbur has a power bigger than uh, it's got power of three, right? So that's enough. So bigger than two is enough. Um, what's kind of important here is you need to know that you need to have an untapped creature, but that's kind of four. Now I'm really focusing on the orcs. There's more, of course, to think about than the orcs because when we're looking um, at the strategy of this deck more as a whole, we see really that white has the strongest amount of creatures. Almost only creatures in the white section end up morale, right? Morale kind of an interesting card, nice finisher, instant two white and one, give all attacking creatures plus one, plus one. So that can be one of those deciders. You do an alpha strike, you throw the morale on, and then the math works in your way instead of against you. So I can see the morale in, in, in some kind of end game scenario uh, be relevant, but the cards that I think are gonna be far more relevant here are Knights of Thorn, and of course the full place of Abbey Gargoyles. Both of these cards have protection from red. That means they work fantastic with Inferno, but also Alex is playing against a mono red deck. So these are really cards to fear for Rob and especially the Abbey Gargoyle because the Knights of Thorn, you can still kill them with an AO pile. I mean, they've got um, um, a toughness of two. So they're, they're relatively easily to kill with an, an AO pile, one AO pile and they're gone, right? Um, but for the Abbey Gargoyle, it's a different story. It flies. Uh, Rob Hartley has, I don't think he has any flyers actually, and it's, it's got protection from red. So I can see the Abbey Gargoyle really being a game winner, maybe even a final winner in this match. I think that's going to be very strong. Then when we look at the rest of the deck of Alex, we see that he really chose red to, um, to destroy creatures. There's a lot of destruction in the red section. No creatures, just cards focused on taking out other creatures. We've got um, the Iron Claw Curse, Interesting card. We talked about that in the semifinals. So if you want to know more about that specific card, maybe go back to that semifinal deck tech section. Uh, but also three Fishers. I think Fisher is, is really strong um, because it's an instant, because it can also destroy a land, which actually can be relevant. Not sure if it's relevant playing against a, a, a monocolor deck, but still you have that option and it buries a creature. So even a creature with regeneration, it cannot regenerate because of that bury clause on Fisher, so I think Fisher is quite strong. Interesting to see that he's only playing with one Dwarven Catapult. I personally, I probably would have taken out the Iron Claw Curses and played with more Dwarven Catapults. But then again, I mean, he, he reached the final, so I guess I guess Iron Claw Curse is maybe stronger than 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 I think it is, and Dwarven Catapult is maybe not as as good in this deck as it would be in, for example, the deck of Rob. Um, we also see a card that we also saw at Rob's and a card that I think can be a, be a complete uh, hoser for Rob if it hits the table. And that card is Anzarin Ruins. So the Anzarin Ruins is an enchantment. And what it does, when it comes into play, you choose a creature type and creatures of the chosen type do not untap. It's as simple as that. It's just one artifact. I believe uh, it's two red and two to cast. And, and the thing is, Alex can play this and Alex can choose dwarves. Almost all the cards, well not, yeah, a big part of the deck of Rob, you know, has creature type dwarves. So if this card hits the table on the side of Alex, it's gonna be a huge problem for Rob. It can be game decisive. So I'm really, really curious 
if this card will find its way on the table and if it will have such a high impact as I think that it can have in this particular matchup. Now, a little side note, maybe you're wondering why is he only playing with one of these cards then if, if it's such a strong card. The reason is they are restricted because it's so difficult for tribal players to play against it in this specific format. Also remember, we don't have Tranquility and we don't have Disenchant in the format. So I thought when I was you know, planning this event, it's really important to kind of contain this particular enchantment because it can just kill so many really cool decks, Thrall decks, um, you know, Merfolk decks, Goblin decks, but also Soldier decks, Dwarf decks like this matchup. So I really wanted to kind of contain it and saying, okay, a one-off is fine, but no more than one. I, I guess the only thing in Rob's deck that can actually get rid of the ruins um, is the Apocalypse Chime. So that's kind of how difficult it is <laughs> to get rid of this card. Okay, so this is the deck of Alex. We've already looked at the deck of Rob. That means it's time to go to the finals. Let's go to game one of the Wizards Cup. Game number one, here we go in the finals of the Wizards Cup. Alex on the play, starting with the basic planes. No Ecation Javelinier for turn one here. Rob starting with a mountain passing turn. So both players taking it easy at the start. Ooh, there we see an AO pile from Alex. The artifact that can deal two damage to any target. Maybe I wanted to say also an AO pile from Rob, but that's not an AO pile. That's a Dwarven Soldier. It's a 2-1 creature, and it gets a bonus when it blocks an Orc. But Alex doesn't play with Orcs, so we're not going to see that bonus. But it's still a 2-1 body. And I'm not sure if Alex really wants to spend the AO pile on this one. So he's probably just going to take two. And the problem with that is while well, you start taking more and more damage, at a certain point you regret it. Okay, so I think this is a good decision from Alex, just getting rid of it straight away. And then, okay, there's an Orcish Miner, so that's an Enchant Land. And it puts, uh, let's just call it Mine Counters. I'm not sure if they're called Mine Counters, but it puts counters on the land. And every turn uh, time it becomes stabbed, you take a counter off. When there are no counters on the land anymore, it destroys itself and it deals two damage to you. And there we see a Clockwork Steed, a card that we uh, we discussed in the uh, deck tech section. So it's a 4-3 creature. Oh, and there goes, <laughs> there goes the webcam of Alex. That is kind of annoying. Again, it's moving. So we'll just have to uh, see, Alex, if you can fix that little problem. But the Clockwork Steed is a 4-3, and every time it attacks, it comes into play with four plus one plus oh counters every time it attacks it loses a counter and uh, there we by the way see the uh, orcish miner also work because we see a counter taken off that mountain so during the upkeep of rob there's also a counter taken off so this is probably the last turn of alex to use it again we see that camera hopefully alex you can you can fix the problem so that this won't happen the entire match. Uh, we do see a serrated arrows, by the way, on the side of Rob. There's an attack here by Rob, and the serrated arrows being used on the Clockwork Steed, and we see that indicated by another counter. So that means only three damage for Rob instead of four. And of course, that one plus one plus O counter is taken off the Clockwork Steed. Um, like all the Clockwork creatures in Old School Magic, you can also uh, put the counters back during your upkeep. So then you untap the Steed and you can put counters back and it taps itself again. So when you want to put counters back on the Clockwork Steed, it does mean that you cannot use it for an entire turn. There we see a Dwarven Hold and a Retribution. Ooh, this is hard. So now Alex got to choose. It looks like he's going to put a minus one, minus one counter on the Steed. And then he also has to sacrifice another creature. So probably has to sac his Order of Lightbird here. So this is just a great scenario for Rob, really hurting Alex a lot here with this play. So it pretty much means that, you know, Alex is going to take another minus one, minus one counter. That means that the Clockwork Steed is now, um, it started as a 4-3, and it's now actually, okay, look at that. It, it dies because Rob is killing it with another Serrated Arrows counter. So Clockwork Steed, Killed and gone, and he still has, I believe, one arrowhead counter on there. And there is a Thopter by Alexander, an O2 creature that for two you can pump it for one mana. And there we see a storage counter being placed on the Dwarven Hold, Rob taking his turn here. So things are actually looking pretty good for Rob. He's, he's very effectively taking care of a lot of the threats of Alex. And Alex is kind of light on cards right now, only two cards in hand. And Rob has... 
three cards in hand there after playing the AO pile. There goes the camera again. <laughs> I do like it, Alex. It's kind of in theme here uh, with Timmy Talks. You know, we've kind of got the, uh, the nautical theme with the Drunken Sailor song at the end of the video. And it kind of reminds me of being on a boat. Uh, there we see the AO pile, uh, by the way, being used on the Thopter. So again, Rob is very effectively just taking care of all the creatures of, of Alex here. And the question, of course, is when is Rob going to play out another creature? And I guess the moment is now here. We see a Dwarven Lieutenant. So that is a 2-1 creature. And for 2 red, you can give it a plus 1, plus 0. Or actually, it's a 1-2 creature. Sorry, so it's not 2-1. It's a 1-2 creature for 2 red. And you can give it Target Dwarf, plus 1, plus 0 for 2 red. So it can also pump itself. There we see another Clockwork Steed. That Clockwork Steed is looking pretty nice with the Zillion Sword. Zillion Sword can pump a creature, so it can basically become a 6-4 if Alex has the mana. He doesn't have the mana right now. There's the attack by Rob. Remember, he can make it 3-2. So does Alex want to trade the Clockwork Steed for the Dwarven Lieutenant? I don't think he wants to. So he's thinking about it right now. And it looks like Rob is checking something here online. He is attacking here and it looks like Alex has taken the damage. I think that's a good decision. You don't want to trade your Clockwork Steed for that. So now he's attacking and putting a minus one, minus one counter on. So that probably means it's going to take three damage unless he uses the sword. Doesn't use the sword. And there is the Abbey Gargoyle. So that is one of the powerhouses in the deck of Alex. And I think one of the, the creatures that can really make a difference here. And Luke Rob is untapping the Dwarven Hold. So I wonder what he's going to do. Maybe he's looking up if Dwarven Catapult targets the, uh, the Abbey Gargoyle. Because that is relevant when you're looking at protection from, in this case, protection from red, of course. So he's untapped. The Dwarven Hold, does that mean he's going to do something here? He is under kind of pressure with that Abbey Gargoyle and the Clockwork Steed. Clockwork Steed being a 2-2 because of that minus one, minus one counter from the Serrated Arrows. There is... Okay, I think... That is dealing some damage here. What card is that again? It's kind of hard to see. Eternal Flame, of course. So Eternal Flame hit Alex there for five points of damage, but also hit Rob for three points of damage. And he also played another AO Pile. So the AO Pile can kind of be useful to, you know, to maybe get rid of the Clockwork Steed. The problem here for Rob is he doesn't have the mana to actually activate the AO Pile and kill the Clockwork Steed. And here we see Alexander... Very clever, Alex, I should say, very cleverly using the Zillion Sword and dealing four points of damage. Look at that life total. Oh, and if Rob would have just had one mana open, he could have killed the Clockwork Seed and not taken those four points of damage. He's on seven right now, and I'm expecting him to at least keep a mana open here, not attacking with, uh, with the Dwarf because of that Abbey Gargoyle with protection from red. Probably Alex is going to swing, and I'm expecting Rob here to use the AO Pile in response, is that what's going to happen here? That's exactly, okay, he doesn't even wait for it. <laughs> he goes like, I'm going to kill it. Uh, it does mean, though, that the Zillion Sword is still tapped, by the way. So technically, that one's still tapped. So it is a good decision of Rob to kind of wait and let Alex decide what he wants to do with that Zillion Sword. And there we see an Order of Lightbearer. And we do see Alex really keeping the Abbey Gargoyle at bay. Ooh, and there I think this is a Brothers of Fire. The Brothers of Fire doing great work against that Order of Lightbur. Killing it straight away does mean another damage for Rob here. And we do know that Alex also plays with Inferno. Yeah, there it is. Inferno. Ho <laughs> ho! I said it and then it came. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, and again, there's a webcam. Anyway, um, interesting first game. I think judging... Uh, by this game number one, I think we're going to see a very tight finals here. Very, very tight finals. So uh, we're going to let these players sideboard and fix their webcams. And then we're going to catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two. Here we go. And uh, 
Alex one game up because of that Inferno. I think we're going to see a lot of Infernos. Both players playing with two in their main deck. And uh, there is that uh, Plains. There's the Dwarven Soldier again by Rob. So the 2-1 creature. And uh, Alex had an AO pile in the first game. But now, of course, he's not on the play. And let's see what he can do. Oh, Iron Claw Curse. And he's taking care of that Dwarven Soldier. And you do see here in this matchup that all the creatures with toughness of one are just so extremely vulnerable. We saw that with Order of Lightbur and Retribution. Now we're seeing it with Iron Claw, Orc, and Dwarven Soldier. There is um, the Zealot hitting the table. So it's a 2 2 creature, it attacks, and then you can choose to deal damage when it's not blocked, or you can choose to have it deal 3 damage to any creature. So the Zealot is, is an interesting little creature. And sometimes you really got to think, do I want to block this? Or do I want to, you know, take the damage? Because it does mean that Alex can then kill one of your bigger creatures. In this case, he has no creature, so it's not relevant. Oh, look at him go here. Clockwork Swarm. And, uh, you know, dealt the first two damage. Then playing the Swarm, a 4-3 creature, just like the Clockwork Steed. And remember, every time it attacks, it loses power. There's a Retribution. Oh. Oh, I really like this Retributions because you're doing two things. I think in this case, Alex is most likely to put a minus one, minus one counter on his Zealot. Uh, although, no, of course, on the, sorry, on the Clockwork Swarm because he wants to deal as much damage as possible next turn. So that is now a 3-2 uh, creature. And it's just so annoying a Retribution because... Uh, you're basically like two of your creatures, one is going down in strength, and it really makes a, a big difference if you hit for four or if you hit for, for three, and and the other creature is just gone. So it's, it's a loose-loose scenario. And there is an AO pile. So there is some early pressure here from, from Alex, and we saw that actually in the, in the first game as well. And the question is, can Rob kind of deal with that pressure? He did very well in game one and still lost, and let's see what he can do in this game. So he's playing an orc. And remember, or cannot block or attack any creature that has a power greater than three. And I believe that that Clockwork Swarm, because it just attacked, it lost one of his power counters. So it is now a 2-2 a two -two because of that minus one, minus one counter. That means that Rob can start attacking with the Orc next turn. So... Now Alex can choose, do I want to put plus one, plus O oh counters on it? But it does mean that it taps itself. And I think that's kind of what they're talking about. So Alex now has to choose, do I want to wind my Clockwork Swarm up? Or did he already pass? Is he already in his main phase? I'm not quite sure. Looks like the players are kind of discussing that right now. It looks like, okay, Alex taking turn, drawing a card, deciding not to put counters on the Clockwork Swarm. Very interesting here. And there is an Ecation Javelin here. A 1-1 one, one. comes into play with an Ecation Counter. And then you can tap the Javelin here, take the counter of deal 1 damage to any target. So together with the AO pile, you can deal 3 damage. That's almost enough to kill the Orc. But of course, the Ecasian still has Summoning Sickness, so he cannot use it now. There's the AO pile on the Clockwork Swarm. There's the attack 6-6. Six, six. Oh, it's really nice to see this in the finals, an Orc attacking. And look at this, another AO pile, and problems are just stacking up here for Alex. He has to take care of that orc, or at least play an Abbey Gargoyle. Abbey Gargoyle or Clockwork Steed can kind of help him get out of this, uh, this mess. But it's going to be very tough, though. And remember, orc also has trample, so chump blocking it with the Javelinier is not really going to help him. In that regard, I'm a little bit surprised that Alex didn't attack with the Javelinier. Just dealing that one point of damage. Because now he's taking six again. Oh, are we going to see an Inferno? Oh, <laughs> get an Inferno. Those Infernos play such an important role. Dealing one damage with the Javelinier as well. Because the Javelinier dies to the Inferno also. Both players taking six. And now it's eight against eight. Wow, what a matchup. There we see a Brothers of Fire. And what else is he going to cast? Dwarven Lieutenant perhaps for two? Or a Dwarven Soldier? Let's wait and see. There's just a lot happening. Keeping it on tap, though, it looks like. Maybe he wants to use his AO pile whenever. What could be in his hand that he wants to play out? 
So just passing turn here, untapped by Alex. Both players on eight. If Rob can win this one, it means he is the new champ. AO pile being used against the Brothers of Fire. There is a Clockwork Steed. If Alex can win this one, there is an AO pile going on six. Does this mean that he has an Inferno? Or maybe Eternal Flame. Yeah, Eternal Flame for the win here for Rob. That means it's 1-1. One, one. Ho ho! And again, again, this was a close match. And, uh, you know, it's 1-1 one, one now. So that means that we're going to go to game number three, the decider. Game number three. And this is the big deciding game. And as you can see, I've kind of put it uh, on normal speed. Usually I play it off twice the speed but for this last game of this tournament i'm just gonna enjoy it 37 players started and at the end of this game one person will be victorious and will crown himself the first wizards cup winner so is it going to be alex or is it going to be rob i have to say both games were so close i, I don't want to i don't want to do a prediction on that one there we see a thopter by alex uh and what's rob going to do he's playing a dwarven lieutenant here in turn two and passing turn so uh, Alex is going to untap. So the Thopter, it's an O2 creature for one, right? It's got flying and you can pay two to give it plus one, plus O. And uh, you can only do that twice. So you cannot make it bigger than two, two. I don't know why they did that. I don't think it would have been overpowered if you could just pump it more than just two, twice. But okay, <laughs> it's it's homelands, right? Uh, there we see a planes from Alex, by the way. So three lands. Is he going to do something? It looks like he's kind of doubting if he wants to pump the Thopter or play something out. Perhaps he's got Aeopile in hand. He could play the Aeopile, of course, and then kill the Dwarven Lieutenant. Dwarven Lieutenant, pretty good creature. It's a 1-2. It can pump other Dwarves for 2 red, give plus 1, plus uh, O. Oh, and because the Dwarven Lieutenant is a Dwarf as well, it can also pump itself. Yeah, so here we see the Aeopile. Is Alex going to use it? He is going to use it. Dwarven Lieutenant is a goner. So the Thopter remains. So that's kind of annoying with the Thopter. If you don't have the mana open to pump it, it basically does nothing. Okay, there we see a Brothers of Fire. Ooh, that is an annoying little creature. Two, two, two red and one. It deals one damage to any target and one damage to Rob. And maybe Alex is kind of regretting not keeping the AO pile for the uh, Brothers of Fire because Brothers of Fire is just such a good creature against you know, taking care of small creatures and actually dealing some direct damage. I think it's a very versatile creature. There we see an attack by the Thopter, pumping it for one. That means Rob's going to drop down to 19. And he's just passing turn. Ooh, he missed a land drop here, I believe. That is unfortunate for Alex. Let's see if Rob has a land to play out. Hopefully this final is not going to be decided by, um, by Alex not drawing into any land. That would be a pity. Attacking here with the Brothers of Fire, Alex dropping to 18 and playing out an AO pile on the side of Rob. So both players playing with a full playset of AO piles. It's probably the most played card of this tournament. It's it just it's such a good card and it gives access to direct damage in every single color because it's an artifact. So I'm not surprised that we see it in almost every deck. There we see a white being tapped. There is an Ecation Javelinier, a 1-1 with the Javelin counter, but look at the Brothers of Fire. It's just gonna kill it with the Brothers, I think, next turn. And Alex probably knows it. The question here is, yeah, he's also gonna swing in. That makes absolute sense. Gonna pump the Thopter, gonna deal that point of damage. Both players now on 18. The problem here is for Alex that next turn, Rob is probably gonna use the Brothers of Fire, kill the Javelin here and getting in for two. Remember, you don't have to tap the Brothers of Fire to use its ability. It's it's not like a Tim in that regard. You just pay two red and one. You can do that as often as you want. And then it deals one damage to any target. That's 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 a deal. So you can still attack with it. And I'm just expecting him to use the Brothers on the Javelin here and attack unless he has a really, really good other option in hand. And it, is he going to do that? He's a little bit in the tank here. Looking at his hand, he's still got, I believe, five cards in there. Tapping three. Yeah, dealing a damage to the Javelin. The Javelin still has Summoning Sickness, so he cannot use that Javelin counter to deal a damage to Rob. He just has to, to put it in the graveyard and also take two from the Brothers of Fire. That kind of feels bad. You know, you lose a creature and you take damage. That is not the transaction that you want. And the Brothers of Fire is doing some work here for Rob in the finals. Can Alex find a land here, by the way? It looks like he's still stuck, though. Attacking for one again. I mean, 
He's got nothing better to do, but that's really bad. This is the deciding game of the Wizards Cup. You know, you you want to at least play a land and, and move forward in life instead of going backwards here. This is not good. Oh, no, an Orc. Orc for Rob. 6-6 six, six, Trampler. This is the worst scenario for Alex to happen here. 6-6 six, six, Trampler. Remember, Orc cannot attack if Alex has a creature with power 3 or bigger on tap. But he doesn't have that at the moment. He also only has his Thopter, an 0-2 creature. Okay, finding a land. Does he have Clockwork Steed or Clockwork Swarm? That can kind of help him here. Hopefully he does. Let's make this game three into a proper game, please. Go, Alex. You can do it. Tapping three. Gonna tap. Tapping four. Clockwork Steed. Okay, good news. Four, three creature. The problem here is now that I'm looking at the board state, Rob has an AO pile and a Brothers of Fire. He can use both of those in combination to kill the Clockwork Steed and attack with the Orc next turn. At least that would mean that Rob got rid of the AO pile if that scenario will un unfold it's looking pretty bad for Alex let's first see if Rob sees it and if he's gonna do it let's see what's gonna happen okay playing another Dwarven hold he's untapped his other hold by the way he's got two mana open does he have Dwarven catapult taking out oh he's got Dwarven catapult oh this is so painful for Alex Oh man, Rob doesn't even need to use the AO pile. Getting rid of both of the creatures, swinging in for eight. Oh man, I really don't see how Alex can get back from this. This is crazy. Is there anything that Alex can do here? I mean, finding another rat, casting an Abbey Gargoyle, that would at least be something. Tapping four, okay, and at least a Clockwork Steed. But like I said in the previous turn, Rob could have used the AO Pile and the Brothers to get rid of that. Is he going to do that now? I mean, uh, it's looking so, so bad here for Alex. At least he's still in it. If you're in it, you can still win it. What is this? Oh, another Dwarven Catapult! Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's playing with a full playset of Dwarven Catapult, so it's not a surprise. But, Rob, you are the winner here of the Wizards Cup. We're, we can call it the Dwarven Cup. You've won it with your beautiful, beautiful Dwarven Tribal deck, and um, you've earned it, man. I have to say, when I'm looking at your deck list, I see flavor and I see functionality combined in perfect harmony you've won this one congratulations and i would like to thank you for watching this tournament right here on timmy talks and if you've been a participant in the tournament thank you for being one of the 37 that played in this fantastic format let me know in the comments below what you think of this by the way would you like to see a wizard's cup number two let me know if you'd like to know more about this event uh, you can also check the description below and there you will find a link uh, to the tournament website where you can find deck photos, you can find the tournament rules, you can find the banned and restricted list, and you can find links to all the other tournament videos if you want to see more games that we played right here in the Wizards Cup. So, okay, Rob, congratulations once again. Also, congratulations to runner-up Alex. You've done very well. You were very unlucky in that third game. If you would have drawn mana, if, 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 Maybe it would have changed. I mean, you had some Abbey Gargoyles in hand. Who knows what would have happened. A very, very entertaining finals. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for watching another video right here on Timmy Talks. If you would like to support the channel, you can do that quite easily. You can leave a like, hit that like button. It really means a lot. You can also leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this tournament you know is it entertaining do you enjoy these videos let me know do you think the right player won it or do you think that alex was just unlucky um let me know you know share your thoughts down below and also you can subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet please consider subscribing it really helps the channel move forward Ta talking about that helping the channel out you can also become a patron of the channel and you can do that by visiting the timmy talks patreon page there's probably an info card popping up right now click on that little info card and then it will take you to the timmy talks patreon page where you can support the channel financially and it already starts 
with one single dollar. And one of the perks of becoming a patron is that your name will appear in the end scroll. How cool is that? Talking about that, let's take a look at the end scroll and let's take a look at all the fantastic and amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ich kann das nicht